This is Echo Zoe Radio, episode 83, for March 2015, with Jordan Hall on Theonomy. Welcome to Echo Zoe Radio, the podcast outreach of Echo Zoe Ministries, where you'll hear about important topics affecting the church today. Our primary goal is to explore a variety of issues while remaining faithful to God and His Word. Stay with us for the next hour as your host, Andy Olson, shares his conversation with this month's guest. Here's your host, Andy Olson. I'm Andy Olson. Thanks for listening to Echo Zoe Radio. This is episode 83 for March 2015. My guest for this episode is Jordan Hall, joining me to discuss theonomy, which is a good topic to follow last month's discussion with Dr. R. Scott Clark on the subject of federal vision. Jordan recently debated theonomy with Joel McDermott of American Vision. Jordan, of course, took that non-theonomist position, and Joel was the theonomist. Jordan is pastor of Fellowship Church in Sydney, Montana, founder of both Reformation Montana and Pulpit and Pen. He's a Reformed Baptist and a friend of Echo Zoe Ministries. As usual, you can find show notes for this episode, including an outline of the discussion, a list of scriptures referenced, and additional resources by visiting echozoe.com slash 83. Don't forget, you can now hear Echo Zoe Radio on TuneIn Radio and on Stitcher. Links to both are on the website. As of this recording, they are easy to find on the right side of any page of the site. Echo Zoe Radio is also heard on Voice in the Wilderness Radio on the weekends. Uh, The times that it airs vary, but there's a lot of great content on there, so I recommend just listening all weekend. In fact, listen all week. Voice in the Wilderness Radio is a streaming radio station that was started by Jordan Hall, and you can find it at wildernessradio.com. With that, here's my discussion with Jordan Hall. Jordan, uh, very great to have you back. You were on with me a while back. We talked about your sermon on the modern day downgrade and you're back and we're going to talk about theonomy yeah it's good to be with you andy i sure appreciate it yeah the timing was fantastic i was just wrapping up editing my last episode on federal vision with dr r scott clark of heidelblog and westminster seminary we talked about federal vision and we got into theonomy a little bit and enough that i would recommend if if anybody who's listening didn't hear that interview Go back and listen to that one, too, because these two subjects really uh, have a lot of overlap. This is two different teachings that tend to be within the more Reformed camp. Echozoe.com slash 82 if you want to listen to that one. So the backdrop for the discussion is that uh, you recently did a debate with Joel McDermott of uh, American Vision in Arizona on theonomy. Could you right. share a little bit about what theonomy is and the debate? And you know, I'd, I'd, I'd kind of like to not get too much into the debate itself, because I think people can watch that for themselves, but we'll, we'll have to touch on it somewhat because it's very relevant to the discussion. Yeah, you know, basically on my program, uh, which I haven't done in a while, the pulpit can, uh, program, I did a five-minute rant, the best word I could uh, use, basically on Christian Reconstructionism. I said, you know, uh, Jesus didn't die for culture in and of itself. He died for people in the culture. And I questioned uh, the narrative that uh, we are to be reclaiming culture for the sake of, of Christ. Uh, we're told in, uh, by the author of Hebrews that Christ will one day roll up the world like a garment and be done with it. And, and culture is one of those things that Christ Jesus will roll up like a garment. Um, he died to redeem first and foremost people. And even though, of course, we would all agree that as people change, the culture around them changes, we have to have a realistic outlook um, and look at history and say, we see small, very, very small examples of, of small pockets of culture be changed or, uh, or redeemed to some extent uh, when there's revival, but these effects are not lasting, um, historically speaking, but we do see souls saved for eternity. And so these are two different things. And that's what I was talking about. That was picked up by Jeff Durbin at Apology Radio, uh, mm-hmm. who took me to task on that. I responded with a three-part series on theonomy on my program. 
um, and got a little bit more specific to the economy itself. And it started because people said, you need to read Rush Duty, you need to read Boggs, you need to read Dork. Uh, Dork. And when I did that, it, it didn't ease my conscience at all towards the doctrine uh, known as uh, theonomy. It, it made me much more uncomfortable, and so I spoke out about it a few times on the website and so forth. And uh, the next thing I know, I've been challenged to a debate by Joel McDermott. That was supposed to happen first on Chris Roseborough's program, Fighting for the Faith. But then, uh, through a set of circumstances, it turned into a, uh, a live debate, and uh, they decided to uh, host a conference in order to have the debate and uh, the God, Government, and Culture Conference, I believe it's called, speakers, uh, Saitun, Bruton K, Jeff Durbin, Marcus Pittman, and others, mm -hmm. uh, Ivy Connolly, I think. And uh, so I flew into Phoenix, had the debate, and uh, the rest is history, I guess. Mm -hmm. I will uh, post a link to the debate. It is on YouTube. As normal, this is episode 83, so anyone listening, if you want to check out the show notes and I really recommend the show notes. There's, there's always some stuff. I, I really go through what we talk about and, um, to, to wrap up and kind of summarize what we talked about. And I, I try to dig in a little bit more with some extra links. If you want to learn more that we don't get to tonight, echozoe.com slash 83 for that. And I will have a link to that debate, uh, where you can go to YouTube and see the debate. So let's start with the, something maybe you didn't discuss, uh, in the debate. And, and I don't remember hearing, you know, I've caught some of your stuff on pulpit and pen and some of your post debate interviews with other podcasts and, uh, YouTube uh, shows. I haven't heard any discussion of post millennialism and it. And my understanding is that post millennialism is a big part of, of theonomy. Is that kind of your finding as well? Yeah, it is. As a matter of fact, the way Bonson defines theonomy, you really can't be a theonomist without being a post-millennialist. Uh, Sutton did the same thing. It's, it's kind of one of the five benchmarks of what theonomy is. Post-millennialism is incredibly important to uh, the concept of theonomy. I personally don't see... I don't see how a premillennialist would rationally be a theonomist, even though, I mean, frankly, they're... They're dispensationalists that would call themselves theonomists. They're Baptists that I think would, in a foolhardy way, call themselves theonomists. But uh, post-millennial eschatology is incredibly important to the notion, particularly, of Reconstruction. It is what they would call the dominion mandate, right? So mm -hmm. uh, God told Adam to take dominion of the earth, and the classical historical rendering of that or understanding would be, uh, this means that we take advantage of the earth's resources, of the animals. We're at the top of the food chain. Really, the definition of civilization is a, uh, humanity's ability to manipulate their environment. I used to, uh, well, I taught two courses at Arkansas State University, and world civilization, that was the first thing that we covered. What is civilization? It is man's ability to manipulate his own environment. That's where civilization begins, the definition. And so we would say, well, when God tells Adam to take dominion, telling them to take advantage of these natural resources, be on top of the food chain, that sort of thing, well, they view the, well, they, they would call it the Adamic Covenant, but they would say the Adamic Covenant is basically a, a dominion mandate to take charge over the earth, they broaden that to basically every sphere, and even turn the Great Commission into uh, sort of a New Testament, New Testament Dominion mandate, uh, where we're taking complete control over all things. And of course, you know, the post-millennial eschatology, which they would call an optimistic eschatology, uh, is at the forefront of, of that idea. Now, as a premillennialist, uh, I don't. I don't consider my eschatology a, a pessimistic eschatology. Um, I was explaining this to my systematic theology class last night. Uh, uh, our beloved Spurgeon said that uh, he believed that more people would be saved by the end of the day than condemned because the millennial reign of Christ, with Christ Jesus sitting on the throne with pestilence and, uh, and war and famine being things of the past, the Earth's population, with people, as the Scripture says, dying young at 100, continuing to have children, this would be a population in love with the Lord, this would be a population that would be, for the most part, converted, and at the end of the day, far more people will be saved and condemned. So I don't consider mine a pessimistic eschatology, but that's what they would call it. The reason why it didn't come up in the debate much is because I didn't want it to, and I told Joel that ahead of time. 
Uh, the reason is, is because the last debate they had, which was in 1988, 25 years ago, roughly, with Gary North and Gary DeMar versus Dave Hunt and Tommy Ice, you know, they, they built it as a theonomy debate. And I think Gary DeMar, if my memory serves, was really the only one, in my opinion, that focused on theonomy in general. It seems like the other three debaters focused primarily on eschatology. It became a debate versus dispensational premillennialism and postmillennialism. Well, I'm not a dispensationalist, I'm a historic premill, but mm-hmm. beyond that, it just it came across as a debate purely on eschatology. Here's the thing, it, eschatology, and I know I'm going to make people scream when I say this, <laughs> eschatology bores me to death. It's just not something that uh, I discuss much. It's not something that I teach on much. I have an eschatology. I just prefer not to argue about it. So I didn't get into the, the, the theonomy debate to discuss eschatology. So that's why it didn't come up much. Okay. But also, it was important to me to recognize, Andy, postmillennialism, I think, is a valid eschatological position. I don't think that it's demonic, that it's uh, heretical or anything like that. I have many, many friends that are postmillennialists. Uh-huh. I wanted to demonstrate to them that you can be a postmillennialist and and still reject theonomy as you ought. Sure. So I think a lot of people just assume, well, I'm a postmillennialist. I guess that makes me a theonomist. And it's important for me to say, uh, no, because most, most postmillennialists are not theonomists, and I wanted to differentiate. Well, I'm glad that you clarified that as far as it not being a you know a, an errant or heretical teaching, but I like to pursue that because it helps me at least to understand things when you start to see how theology can, can fork, you know, as you described teaching systematic theology, a lot of times when you start with one doctrine, logically that will progress you towards other doctrines. And so it's, it's good to kind of see how those forks work, and how that foundation builds up through time to other doctrines. Well, right. If, if in the post, you know, millennialist understanding of eschatology, mm-hmm. price will be coming after, the millennial reign. The millennial reign is coming in all of its fullness, and it's mankind that's helping to usher it in. It's not Jesus coming from the sky um, in a white robe, sure. you know, who's has a name written on him that no one else knows, who's come to make his enemies his footstools and rule with a rod of iron. But it's the church that is doing this. Well, then we start asking questions like, well, how will we bring in the reign of Christ? How will we bring down the kingdom of God? How will we allow it to come into its fullness, and one of the solutions that they've come up with is, well, let's implement the Mosaic Civil Code over the nations today. This will help uh, help bring in the post-millennial paradise that's coming. So that's really the relationship between those two ideas. Okay. And you talk about the Mosaic Civil Code. Now, that was the nature of the debate you did. You were debating the precept that the Mosaic Civil Code was obligatory to civil governments today, and Joel was in the affirmative, and you were debating the the negative. Right, that was the resolution in his first in his first post on the website, the American Vision Afterward, which is really the last the last post on AV that I've read because I just don't care to get into the back and forth. That's why uh-huh. I did the debate to avoid to avoid the back and forth. But uh, he had complained that I made the whole debate about the civil code being obligatory, and it's like, well, that is kind of the resolution of the debate. Well, that's you yeah. Know, so. Yeah, so there's a reason for that. That's not a part of theonomy. Uh, that's theonomy in a nutshell. Okay. Um, that the civil code is obligatory for nations today. That is really theonomy. Theonomy is it doesn't exist outside of that understanding and presupposition. Should civil governments today, better question, must civil governments today implement the exhaustive detail of the civil code given to the commonwealth of Israel? That's interesting. If you pay attention to that debate, I said the law given, the civil code given to the Commonwealth of Israel, I don't know how many times, I'm guessing several dozen, mm-hmm. and uh, Joel never corrected me on that. Well, that's a statement of supposition. I'm supposing something that he never argued. I'm supposing that the civil code was given to the nation by politics, the Commonwealth, in other words, of the nation of Israel. And he, he never refuted that or, or even phrased it differently, never tried or attempted to correct me, and I think that's because Biblically, you can't. It's very evident, very clear in Scripture. That was a civil code given to the commonwealth of Israel, the typological, redemptive, historical foreshadow of the coming church, while they were in the land that God had given them prior to the uh, to the uh, uh, resurrection of Christ. And so that's the question. 
must we uphold a civil code that was given to a specific people for a specific time? And historically, and in terms of the Orthodox world, the answer is no, that we uh, submit ourselves to the general equity, which is the moral precept of those civil laws, but not the jot and the tittle uh, of the civil code itself. Yeah, there was a bit of discussion about the division of the law and going back to the Westminster Confession. Uh, and and with you, you go to Westminster because this is primarily a Presbyterian doctrine, correct? Well, right. It's the Presbyterian Confession. I, I'm a Reformed Baptist. I hold the 1689 Confession, which they they both draw off the Irish Articles, but they're very similar one to another. But theonomists and, tend to be uh, Presbyterians, so, if, if I understand correctly. Yeah, that's correct. And you have some confused Baptists that don't know they should be theonomists, <laughs> but yeah, for the most part. So I was I was trying to point out an inconsistency in, in that position. One of yeah. the more notable quotations from that debate that people have repeated again and again is when I said, uh, they are, uh, speaking of the honest, they are Vantillians without Vantill, they are Calvinists without Calvin, and they are Presbyterians without a confession, that they really are theological orphans of the 20th uh, century. They have some posterity, they have some children that are aberrant, like uh, federal vision and kinism, which is basically racism that comes directly from uh, R.J. Rush duty, the uh, charismatic dominionist, the seven hill theology, mm-hmm. and so on. Uh, That's when the baffles me. Why, why is that? The link between um, the federal vision and theology, uh, theonomy on one side, and then the charismatic, you know, new apostolic dominionism on the other hand, they seem so distant. Yeah. That was an intentional, by design, purposeful marriage between theonomy and the charismatics. I don't have my notes in front of me. It's been, what, four weeks, three weeks since I, I did the debate. I've, since then, I've... I went to Shepherd's Conference and had my head filled with all sorts of good things, so I've forgotten some. I don't have my notes in front of me, but uh-huh. um, I believe it was a meeting in, like, 87, something like that, with Joseph. Uh, Joseph Moorcraft was there. Gary North was there, I believe. And it was with uh, Charismatics in Texas, and they came out of the meeting, and I believe it was Moorcraft, uh, Joseph Moorcraft, who said, this is a great new relationship we're forging, and we're going to be using, quote, the Presbyterian theology, the Baptist schoolmaster, and the charismatic telecommunications uh, uh, to accomplish our goals. And so they wed them together. And so, you, you know, you have guys like Marcus Pittman putting up a blog. I've seen, I'm not sure when, but it was, you know, well, don't, don't throw in theonomists with those crazy dominionists. Hey, man, you, you made the crazy dominionists. They got that directly from you. That's uh, It's not a correlation. That is a causation. You wow. were the ones that created these uh, these dominionists here. And yeah, they, they went way more aberrant than even what you are, but uh, the, now they've thrown out the civil code and they've just run with, uh, well, in part, but now they just run with uh, dominionism and, and reconstruction as their major tenet. But uh-huh. uh, it's not like, hey, they're kind of similar. No, they <laughs> one gave birth to the other. Wow. No, uh, yeah, what I was heading with the Westminster was to talk about this three threefold division of the law because it, it comes up a lot. This uh, yeah, idea does. of there being a moral, uh, civil, and a ceremonial you, law. Yeah, if you notice that in, in the debate, I had brought up a uh, quotation from Bonson who uh, made it very clear, not just in that one quotation, but in the entire book, Theonomy and Christian Ethics, which is sort of the flagship book of Theonomy, that he denies a true and authentic separation of the civil code from the moral law. And uh, Joel seemed to want to argue that point, but then when I asked him in cross-examination if he could find anywhere in Scripture that a nation outside of Israel had been judged for not following the civil code, and he said no, and his response also included the line, but I don't make that distinction. Right, that's my mm-hmm. point. You don't make that distinction. So for the listener that doesn't know what I'm talking about, uh, the Westminster, the uh, LBC, uh, you know, um, 1689, they divide the law into three. By the way, this is not just uh, Presbyterians and Baptists, but others. Mm -hmm. Um, There is the civil code given to the Commonwealth of Israel for the governance of that nation, which was very important among a people in primitive land who were at great risk of being annihilated through pestilence, through disease, through famine, through war. And also a nation that was with no believers or very few believers that were guided by the Holy Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit, prior to Jesus' coming, would come, touch down upon certain men, like King Saul, for example, and then leave again. 
they weren't guided by the Spirit. So the schoolmaster, the pedagogue, like uh, Paul says to the Church of Galatians, the pedagogue existed, the schoolmaster, the tutor, until the seed that was promised would come, and that is Jesus. Now with Christ also is followed by the Holy Spirit. And so there's the civil code given to the Commonwealth of Israel. There is the ceremonial law that has passed away because it has been fulfilled in Christ. And then there is the moral law, and the moral law is different than the first two. The moral law is tied intrinsically to God's nature. It does not change because God does not change. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I've pointed out in the debate is you see God acting contrary to the civil code given to the nation of Israel. Outside of Israel, you see the ceremonial law be specifically abrogated in the New Testament. But at no point do you see the moral law disappear, neither do you see God ever act contrary to his moral law. Why? Because it's tied to his nature. So the moral laws, the Baptist Catechism says, exist to teach us our duty, make clear our condemnation, and show us our need of a Savior. Now, what the Armists do, Andy, is like Monson, they lump it all into God's law. Actually, they only lump two of those three into God's law. But they say it's God's law, it's God's law. And they make the debate about God's law, refusing to make that distinction. In the, uh, I don't, I didn't read it, didn't listen to it, so I don't know if it was a blog post or if it was a, a radio program that Apologia did, uh, and they called the debate, debate over God's law. That's a perfect example of, of the dishonesty that I'm talking about, mm-hmm. refusing to give distinctions where they're due. The title of that debate was, Are Mosaic Civil Laws Obligatory for Governments Today? But when they review the debate, Apology and Jeff Durbin said, uh, called it rather a debate over God's law. Not God's law, the civil code as a part of God's law. Well, when you lump them all in together, obviously, if you say that there is no law today, you're an antinomian. So they'd say, you deny God's law, you're an antinomian. No, uh, we believe the civil code was given to the Commonwealth of Israel. The scripture makes that very clear in the Old Testament as well as the New. What we're saying is, we are under the moral law. I'm not a dispensationalist. I have no problem saying that. I believe the moral law is the same as the law of Christ or the law of love. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's some agreement there with the dispensationalist. But I I believe very much that we are under the moral law in that respect, not for justification, but in terms of our duty towards God and towards fellow man, but not the civil code. But when you frame the debate as they do, then you can accuse anyone of being an antinomian, which is, of course, what they do. They call us antinomians. So if you didn't know you were an antinomian, Andy, you just need to talk to a theonomist to find out that most certainly you are. Well, that was something, you know, I don't want to nitpick too much with the theonomist side, because we would both regard them as brothers in Christ, and it, it gets easy to kind of pick apart each, you know, the other side and have some mudslinging here and there. But, you know, one thing, I I go back to uh, about October of... Uh, 2013, I, I taught a session, a seminar on logic at uh, church. And that is uh, on the website. You know, I've been, it's a, a tool for fundraising for Echozoe Ministries, formal logic, informal logic. And so when I heard that Joel had written a book on logic, that of course sparked my interest because I, I like logic. I find interest in logic. But logic is kind of a double edged sword, it's, it's a very powerful tool to use in uh, reason and understanding and in debates. But in my opinion is that it can be dangerous because once you've especially taught logic, not let alone learned it, um, you're kind of held to a higher standard and, and you should, you should know a fallacy when you see it and you certainly should go out of your way not to commit them. And I, I saw quite a few that I would say, you know, Joel, you should know better. <laughs> there, that's a fallacy. And, and you, you call them out on as much uh, a few times. Yeah, there was one instance in the debate, the debate that, uh, because I had read his book on biblical logic, and I was trying to point out some of those logical fallacies. Mm-hmm. I had uh, I had uh, read thousands uh, of, of pages, 27,000, in fact, uh, since, I think it was John Speed said, that's impossible. He would have had to have read 180 pages a day. Well, I don't know if your reading ability, but that's not tough for me. I did, mm-hmm. and I had um, some assistants at church, six of them, in fact, collate my notes and there was some confusion there. I had mentioned that he pointed out that the uh, law, of ex- excuse me, that uh, excluded middle was a fallacy. He was using it as a law, but uh, if you if you <laughs> that depends entirely upon which school of logic you follow. Right. The, the the law of excluded middle would be the formal side of logic. There's formal. Right. And I, I believe it to be a, I believe it to be a fallacy. It's also known as a false dilemma. Right. But 
Yeah, there were some of those logical fallacies, but here's the thing, Andy. Here's what's interesting. Logic is inherently evidence of natural law. Uh-huh. And every theonomist listening to this just had their head explode. <laughs> but that's true. It's a demonstration of what God has planted within the laws of nature and in the minds of man that are indisputable. They are factual, and they are, until Jesus wraps up like the world like a garment, they are immutable. Mm-hmm. Logic is evidence of natural law. The theonomist hates the concept of natural law. They can't stand that concept, and I, I would even believe, we may be getting off on a topic you didn't anticipate, but it's important no, it's okay. you know, to me, if, if you don't mind. The, the Bible itself is very clear that there is a natural law. Uh, when Paul writes about, you know, even their women do uh, what, by nature, they know they ought not do, this is clearly uh, evidence that God has written his law upon our hearts. Uh, it is something that is a part of nature. We we know certain things about God from the things that have been made. Um, and one of the things that have been made, not just the stars and the sky that, that demonstrate the, the glory of God in his handiwork, but this thing called logic, the theonomists must deny by necessity that natural law exists. Mm-hmm. Or they would say certain things like Monson did, that natural law is basically uh, the moral law tainted through human sin. Well, I don't entirely disagree with that premise, because natural law, unlike God's law, let me put it this way, they would say natural law, unlike God's law, it must be viewed for, through the human lens. Here's what I would say. Even God's law is viewed through a human lens, and that's why you have such great disparity between the way theonomists interpret the uh, the civil code. Rush Dooney claimed that all agricultural science was an attack upon God's word. All agricultural science is an attack against God's word. Marcus Pittman did a post a while back, which I thought was great, on uh, why GMOs are a blessing and not a curse. Uh, you have theonomists disagreeing with themselves. You know, uh, Rush Dooney claimed that the polygraph was unbiblical for some such reason or another. Hmm. So even God's civil code given to the Commonwealth of Israel must be interpreted through the human lens and therefore subject to a uh, tainted perspective. So I don't think that we need to be quick to dismiss natural law when it comes to at least understanding the basic concept of right and wrong that every human being has because God's given it to them. Yeah, you quoted Romans chapter 2 in that regard as well. Right, yeah. Well, I think it's, 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 it's all over that mm-hmm. uh, we know certain things. Even, I mean... What does what does the scripture teach us that even the uh, even the pagan, whether or not they have been given the moral law, whether or not they have received the tablets of stone like the Gentiles, are still held accountable to that moral law. Yep. The anonymous though would go one step further, of course, and say, well, they're also accountable and held guilty for violations of the civil code. And we'd say, no, I don't, I don't think the civil code is written upon the hearts of man. Look at the details of the civil code and ask yourself a question: Do you think? All men on every continent, uh, in every tribe and tongue and nation, do you think they uh, have a basic understanding of the civil code? No. But do they know it's wrong to lie, steal, covet, commit adultery, dishonor their parents? Yes, they know that. Mm -hmm. That's the natural law that's written upon our hearts, which happens to be the same moral law that's been written upon stone. Right. Well, when I was going after logic, I was going to, I was just, what I was getting at too also was that this labeling of anybody who's not a theonomist as a latent antinomian would be a, f- a form of an ad hominem attack, which is to say you're attacking the person, not the argument. Well, it is. I don't worry too much about ad hominems. Well, one man's ad hominem yeah. is, is not to another. Bonson's buddy, whoever it was that gave a short review, said that Joel was brave and withstood ad hominem after ad hominem. And, I think people can watch the debate for themselves. I just, you know, I genuinely don't think I, I was well, guilty of any ad hominem. Yeah, and I, I think the difficulty was, you know, I could, it was, it's clear as you're watching the debate that, that a, a major part of the problem is that you're almost speaking two different languages. You, you kind of are talking past each other. I had a really hard time understanding Joel's view. You know, I agree with your view, but I had a hard time really understanding his because it seemed like he was all over the map. And, and it made it harder to follow the debate because the, the point of a debate is that at least the other side might better understand your side of the view uh, of the, well, the argument. Well, it's, it's an absolute, yeah, the have absolutely redefined terms 
Well, this isn't um, a, I mean, this isn't a smear on, on the theonomist at all. I mean, my point is that sometimes that's just part yeah, of you don't want their, disagreement. You, you is, don't want their hate mail. <laughs> well, let's, let's be honest. You don't, you don't want them to turn on you next. Uh, just ask Roseboro and White, and the Bible thumping wing nut fella uh, about that. But yeah, no, I don't, I don't think you're exactly at all, Andy. But, you know, if you redefine general equity shamelessly, uh, if you redefine what an antinomian is, if you redefine God's law. If you, you know, they they can't even call the Old Testament the Old Testament because they don't see any discontinuity between the covenant. They want to change it a little bit and call it the Older Testament because that sounds better. It's a redefinition of terms to make them appear orthodox. So we are talking around each other. If I had right. to do that debate again, and I wouldn't do that debate again, maybe one of these days I'll debate Reconstruction, but I'd probably choose a charismatic dominionist to debate it. But uh, I would, I would insist if I had to do it over again to define terms before we get started. That would be essential. Even if we couldn't agree on those terms for the sake of the listening audience, we need to define yeah. these words, because the theonomists operate from a vocabulary, from a glossary that has been completely changed from a historic definition of terms. And I, again, I don't have my notes in front of me, but I, I believe it. Uh, well, I, no, I don't want to say it, it was Bonson North or Rush duty, but they had talked at one point about uh, antinomianism and admitted that they co-opted it, they changed the definition of what antinomian was. This doesn't help the debate, it doesn't help intellectual right. honesty, it doesn't help us progress conversation. And to when be fair, do that do doesn't necessarily mean that if those men redefined it, that the that the their spiritual descendants that are in theonomy today necessarily are knowingly doing the same thing. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I think they are. Um, okay. I think they are. Um, I think they're using these words knowing. That's that's not what, an antinomian is someone who doesn't believe in any of God's law. They don't believe they have any commands to follow, and they're godless. That's what an antinomian is. Right. They don't believe in sanctification. Don't believe in righteousness. Don't believe in holiness. They're just uh, the, the antinomian is the one that, when asked the question, "Should we continue to sin so that grace may abound?" Instead of saying, "God forbid" or "Never let it be," they say, "Amen." That's the antinomian. The antinomian is not someone that says historically uh, orthodox. Uh, in an orthodox fashion, that we are to submit to the moral precepts of God, that we are not to sin against God, the Ten Commandments teach us our duty to make clear our condemnation and show us our need of a Savior. That's not an antinomian. And, and I think on some level they realize that, but again, listen, when you are operating without any historic grounding, you have to take historic definitions and define them your own way. And that's what's happening in the autonomy. There's also, uh, it came up, some confusion between law and gospel apparently going on with theonomy is. Can you talk a little bit about the law gospel side of things? Yeah, I can. I think that's the biggest threat to me between law and gospel. A couple of things came out in the debate. One was North and Chilton's book in the foreword saying that uh, evangelism is teaching people to obey God's law. And Joel said in the rebuttal, that well, that was you know that was obviously that was a book about the Great Commission. That, that part of the Great Commission is teaching people to observe everything that Christ has commanded, and so that's a part of the evangelism. Well, here's the thing: the Great Commission is not about evangelism. The Great Commission is about discipleship, disciple the nation. We have plenty of places to look in the Scripture to uh, find a didactic uh, command to uh, evangelize, uh, but the Great Commission is not one of them. Contrary to popular opinion, it is about discipleship. Evangelism is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, not that you should do it, but that Christ has done it. That is the good news, and it has nothing to do with teaching people to observe uh, Christ's commands. Um, and then I pointed out uh, Bonson's rendering of Matthew chapter 5, 7 through 20, and the violence that his definition of plurao does in verse 17 to verse 20, uh, great violence. And, you know, I, I was told he tried to pull a, a quotation from Spurgeon, where Spurgeon uh, agreed, apparently, uh, that plurao meant to confirm or to establish, which is what the theonomist does. Here's the thing, though. If you want to make plurao mean confirm uh, or establish, you know, Matthew Henry gave five possible definitions of that word. That is the fifth and least likely, according to Matthew Henry, because all other 17 times the word is used, it means to fulfill in a prophetic sense. But Spurgeon was not a theonomist, meaning that even if he accepted Matthew Henry's fifth definition of that word, that would mean that Christ has established or reestablished or asserted, reasserted 
the moral law, which in fact, in a sense, is what Jesus did in the Sermon on the Mount. He didn't get any new law. He simply asserted what was already there, gave it the fullest meaning, explained the spirit of the law, as opposed to the letter of the law. But Bonson, in verse 17 of, uh, of uh, Matthew chapter 5, in his assertion that, uh, that Christ did not fulfill it, but rather he established uh, the law, does violence to verse 20, demonstrating that the righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees is accomplished by following the law better than the Pharisees did. Now, in a way, our righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, not only, not only because of what has been imputed to us in Christ. That is the main purpose and reading of this text, I believe. It is a justifying righteousness because it's the type that, you know, it says you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees. This is not a sanctifying righteousness. This is a righteousness that justifies because by it we enter the kingdom of God. We were talking about this at Shepherd's Conference with my friend Matt Rawling, and he had a good point, and that is our works are more acceptable to God than the Pharisees because they come from faith. But that's not the context of Matthew 5, verse 20. It's not that we do things by faith and our personal righteousness, our holiness, in other words, exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees. This is a justifying righteousness that comes from what Christ has fulfilled. Now, that, that may seem like a small matter, but the question of how our righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, that's a huge matter. And it comes back to the imputation of Christ. But just ask yourself the question. Who's doing the heavy lifting in, in theonomy? Is it the law or is it the gospel? So here's the here's the biggest explanation I can give you, Andy, of the gospel confusion in theonomy. The Orthodox historic Christian gives the law in order to bring the gospel. We use the law to cut the heart. Uh, we use the law to kill, to maim, to wound, to destroy, so that we can then give the gospel and let the gospel reign and bring them back to life, provide the balm of Gilead, and and to heal and to make us whole. The theonomists and the Reconstructionists give the gospel, they claim anyway, in order to make people faithful to the law. Mm. They have it backwards, and the heavy lifting is being done by the law, not the gospel. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, that's a that's an important distinction. And I bring up law and gospel because, you know, I, we, we talk about that last month with Federal Vision, and that there's definitely, that's, that's a big area where there's a lot of crossover between Federal Vision and theonomy. Well, and I think, you know, the, the Lutherans more or less have taken my side in this debate, which is interesting because I'm not used to that, <laughs> you know, because we go back and forth on that. I think I used a quotation one time from Spurgeon calling baptismal regeneration priestcraft. Uh-huh. And uh, I'm on so many Lutheran blacklists now. So <laughs> but Jordan, Jordan Cooper came out on his program, uh, Justin Center, and so did Chris Roseboro, you know, defending my take on theonomy. And I think that's because the Lutherans, if I could say something commendable to my uh, brothers on that side of the aisle, they work hard distinguishing between law and gospel. Uh-huh. And uh, I've, I've been immensely blessed by uh, Chris's ministry and teaching me the difference between law and gospel, because frankly, in the Baptist churches that I grew up in, there was no distinction between law and gospel. And, I, you know, I, I think that's why the Lutherans have come down so hard on theonomy, because it's, it's pretty evident that when you mm-hmm. understand a distinction between law and gospel, they're putting the uh, cart in front of the horse. Yeah, that's funny. I think the interaction with, with uh, Roseboro, I think, uh, I, I look back, I, I talked to Chris Roseboro a while back. He was a, a great person to talk to when I wanted to get into Hebrew roots. And so I had him on and we talked about a few issues. And if I remember correctly, this idea of a threefold division of the law came up and my expressing, you know, that's how we reason with, you know, I, I was using it to describe how we'd, we'd reason with unbelievers who might take issue with our, uh, our issues on say, say homosexuality that, uh, you'll often hear people say, well, if you're going to abide by that, then shouldn't you be avoiding shellfish and, uh, uh you know, the food laws and, and not having robes made out of different uh, materials and whatnot. Yeah. And, and One thing, Andy, that can help people understand that, in terms of the historical context within the New Testament Church, uh-huh. is, and it didn't come up in the debate, is Acts chapter 15. Yep. Acts chapter 15 is the Apostolic Council, uh, or the Jerusalem Council, for a call it that, who were discussing the question, what laws are we to now follow? Yeah. The fact that the council was had at all demonstrates to us that uh, theonomy was not the uh, modus operandi, it was not the status quo, 
why right. even have such a conference? Just follow, just follow everything that was not a foreshadow or type of shadow. Yeah. They didn't, they didn't do that. Uh, but it, well, I wondered though. And, and Chris is right in in terms of Hebrew roots and Messianic Christianity, which I I want to write a book it's called Rise of the Hyponomian, uh-huh. which means under the law. The first half dealing with Hebrew roots, the second half dealing with theonomy. Yeah. Because the theonomists the make the same mistake as the Judaizers, except they do it with you know the with civil the civilized code, the sort of ceremonial. Law. Yeah. If you if you are unable or unwilling to divide the law in this way, in the same way God divided the law when He put the moral law in the Ten Commandments uh, in the Holy of Holies uh, inside the Ark of the Covenant and left out the other. If you refuse to divide it the same way the Bible does, there is nothing preventing you uh, from becoming a theonomist or a Galatian Judaizer. You need that distinction. It needs to exist. It's right. a real distinction. And, and here's the thing. You can listen to most rallying cries of the honest. Follow God's law. Not one jot or tittle will pass away. And they have no apologetic for when you say, wouldn't that cover, cover the ceremonial law too? Well, of course not. Why, in your system, the honest, would that not cover the ceremonial law? Why are we not obligated to follow that? Right. And, and they really have no reasonable answer. Well, Mike, the question I was going to get at, though, with Chris was that, you know, Chris being a Lutheran, uh, do they have a different understanding of that threefold division of the law? Because when I mentioned that to Chris, you know, he kind of said he, he he had some differences of opinion on that. Well, yeah, and I'm not a Lutheran theologian. Maybe they would be better to ask. I had a long right. conversation with Chris about this back in October, probably, and you know, I explained to him what our Baptist Catechism says, what's the point of the Ten Commandments, to teach us our duty, make clear condemnation, show us our need of a Savior. And we got into a, a loving argument on uh, the Sabbath day, uh-huh. um, because uh, I'm a Sabbatarian, and I believe it's a part of God's moral law, and I understand I'm in the minority position on that, but uh, I am a 1689 Baptist, so I, I, I believe that it still exists, although the administration has changed its same and substance. Um, and yeah, there was obviously some difference of a of a pity there, and um, yeah, I don't. I I wish I could could answer the question, but um, yeah, usually, and I'm sorry, this I'm was a discussion on to, theonomy. I don't mean to go off yeah, on Lutheranism, I'm, I'm but just, yeah, I'm just trying to stay out of arguments with Lutherans right now. <laughs> so yeah, uh, one of my New Year's resolutions. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, and I know I I love Chris, and I know you do too. And uh, you know I don't I don't ask the question to try to poke any eyes. Uh, well, but, here, but here's just a to better agreement. have a better understanding of theology and where we might differ uh, as far as uh, Here, denominationalism yeah. goes. Here's a good, here's a good agreement though that we would have with the Lutherans when Rush Dooney says that sanctification is by law. Uh huh. That would make the Lutherans gasp. In, in horror, quite frankly, mm-hmm. because that's obviously not what the Scripture teaches. You know, we would both agree very much with that. So it's interesting that I, having brought up this discussion on Hebrew roots, I you tied some loose ends that I wouldn't have thought to tie together on that. You, but you basically, you brought up the Hebrew roots movement as not understanding the fulfillment of the ceremonial law in Christ— and then tie that to the, the theonomists who do the same thing with the civil law. And I had in my notes, I was going to ask you about a couple areas where people are tend to enforce religious law that you and I would say is not meant for us to enforce. And one of them was the Judaizers. I was going to ask you what you got accused of being a, a latent antinomian. And my, my question is, could they then be accused of being latent Judaizers? Yeah, I I do not hesitate to call them, um, or to accuse them, rather, of Judaizing the civil codes. I don't have a problem saying that. As long, you know, I wouldn't call them a Judaizer, simply a Judaizer, because in the classical sense, that wasn't the Galatian heresy. But if, if, right. you, want to add a, if you wanted to add a caveat, Judaizing the civil code, that's exactly what they're doing. In the Galatian heresy, they were telling people, you're not an Israelite but you need to become like one in order to be acceptable to God. The theonomist says, well, this isn't Israel, but we need to follow its laws in order for our culture to be acceptable to God. Mm-hmm. That's the that's the error. It's the same error. 
Now let me let me let me add this to you so that I'll save Joel a blog post when he <laughs> obviously writes about this. Another difference, and it is an important difference. I want to be as fair as I can. The Galatian Judaizers, it would appear in Scripture, were Judaizing for the sake of justification. The Theonomist typically does not. It is typically sanctification that uh, their Judaizing stems from or, or uh, would seek to uh, promote. So there, there would be that difference. But in terms of not understanding the, the division of law and how that leads them into doctrinal error, it's the same error. And that was really serendipitous that it would come up like that with the discussion with uh, Roseboro. And so, uh, yeah, thanks for, for tying that together because it's, it's interesting. And Well, Hebrew roots. Hebrew roots, man, it drives me, drives me nuts. It really does because I see, <laughs> well, I see it taking people over. I had Paul Washer visit one time and we were preaching at a little uh, Indian church that we were sponsoring uh, mm-hmm. on the reservation. And he, uh, there were some boys that came to hear him preach that were um, obviously dabbling in Hebrew roots. And I saw uh, Brother Washer yell at them. Like, he pounded his fist on the table and he said, look at me when I talk to you. I'm trying to, I'm trying to uh, save your soul. He was very emphatic. I'm like, Paul, what was that about? He's like, you know, this leads people away from Christ. It leads people away from the gospel. One moment they think that... Uh, they need to be using, uh, you know, the term Yahweh or uh, Jehovah uh, to worship God. The next moment, you know, they're buying a prayer shawl to think that they're getting closer to God if they wear it when they pray. Um, and then, you know, they're they're uh, blowing the shofar at the church, and then they're calling the church a synagogue. And then they actually know they they become idolaters. This isn't the religion of of, of the New Testament. And I began to study that, <laughs> the, the Hebrew roots movement um, and the uh, so-called Messianic uh, Christianity. And what became very clear as I began to read the works of those who'd come out of the movement, first of all, very few of, of uh, very few people who go to a Messianic congregation are Jews by birth. Mm-hmm. Uh, very few of them are of the physical lineage of Abraham, but they're trying so hard to become that way. What is that? God the Son came to save the, the Gentile. We don't have to become like a Jew in order to be acceptable to God. The other major error, uh, and I know I'm getting off track, but the other major error of, of the movement uh, is that uh, this so-called Messianic Christianity, the Hebrew roots, is not an imitation of Old Testament Judaism. Uh, it is an, if, and if it were an imitation, it'd be bad enough. But it's an imitation of rabbinic Judaism. Rabbinic Judaism post the fall of the temple is an imitation of historic Judaism, Old Testament Judaism. It's very simple. Mm-hmm. Without the temple and without priests, you do not have Judaism. It cannot exist without the temple. It does not exist without the temple. So they are imitating an imitation, mm-hmm. uh, which is incredibly sad. Again, these are the errors that, that you fall into when you refuse to divide the law the same way God did in the Scriptures. As I said in debates, if anybody wants to listen to it, you'll hear how the God himself divided uh, these three forms of law yep. um, in, in, in a number of different ways. You know, my opponent said in the debate, Joel said, so, it's several times, in fact, so you're saying that it's different just because it was written on tablets of stone. And it's like... Uh, as a matter of fact, my brother was in the audience, and he's like, uh, yeah, that is kind of an important <laughs> that is kind of an important distinction. I mean, the fact that the Ten Commandments are written on tablets of stone and not the civil code, that is, I mean, think about it, you know, the fact that God delivers it by his voice directly to the people, but not the ceremonial or civil law, the speaks of its preeminence. So uh, when the Theonomist says, listening audience, when the Theonomist says, we see a distinction, well, they see a distinction without a difference, mm-hmm. and it's a pointless distinction that they make merely to appear orthodox, and it's a distinction that has no real, tangible, operational, uh, demonstrable difference. Um, and so they lump them all in together, or at least lump in the civil and, and the moral law together. Another one that, you know, I brought up Judaizing. There's another one that I've had in mind, and I've just had a few kind of private discussions on theonomy and I've heard it come up as well, uh, privately, 
It didn't come up on the debate. I know that if there are any theonomists that are listening, they're going to cringe when I ask this. But I, I want to address it just nonetheless. You're not going to bring up Sharia, are you? You're, you got it. You, is this... <laughs> what? I can read your mind. <laughs> well, I mean, if I were a theonomist, I would cringe. I would. Yeah, well, they're calling you a blasphemer right now and writing, they're firing up their blog. Um, well, I, and I don't mean it. I, I really honestly don't mean it to poke a finger in their eye, but I know people are wondering about it. Like, that's that's just kind of naturally where we go as is the you know, theological thinkers. Well, I mean, obviously, obviously, Sharia is under Islam, which is a blasphemous religion and has nothing to do with God's law. But okay, so the comparisons and the differences. <laughs> Doctor White brought it up the other day, and every theonomist in the world had an absolute conniption hit the about it. I saw that, and, um, and that's and, and uh, if you listen to what he said, they should not have. It was reasonable and accurate. Mm-hmm. But I know it's thrown in their face, and so it was an instantaneous emotional reaction that, that wasn't guided by thought and insight, you know, intellectually. So you know, I give them a pass on that because it, sure. there can be unfair comparisons. First of all, Sharia law is not from the Word of God. Uh, it, it does not exist to teach us our duty, make clear condemnation, show us our need of a Savior. Uh, it was not delivered, uh, written, in, according to Exodus 33, written by the very finger of God in the tablets of stone. It wasn't laid in the Ark of the Covenant. And... Okay, so let me lay it out here. And back to Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Mm-hmm. Jesus says, I've not come to destroy the law. That word is kataluo in Greek, and it's the same word used in all of the Gospels that Jesus says when he, when he talks about the destruction of the temple, kataluo. It, it is a violent, aggressive, angry, total annihilation and destruction. Mm-hmm. Jesus is saying he's not come to annihilate the law this way. He's not disrespecting it. He's not collapsing it. He's not uh, violently tearing it apart. He's not doing that, but he has come to fulfill it. Okay, so the law is to be treated preciously. Even if it is the civil code of Israel, it, it need not be stretched, you or taken out of context. While we're making theonomous mad, let me say, I think that they do cataluo the law because they twist it, contort it, stretch it to make it say what they want it to say. We shouldn't do that. We should right. be above that. Should should not engage in that. So we don't want to compare, at face value, God's civil code, which is good, righteous, pure, and holy for the Commonwealth of Israel, to Sharia law. But there is a, a comparison, and it's a rightful one, and that is Muslims believe they are bringing in this utopian paradise that is pleasing to a law, in part by bringing to the world a judicial code. That's the fact. Right. The fact is, the anonymous think they're ushering in paradise and utopia that is pleasing to God by basically proselytizing and pushing a civil code, a judicial code. That is a rightful comparison. It's a rightful comparison. Mm-hmm. There's another comparison, and that is, that's a tougher one for them to stomach, I think. We are under the civil code of Israel in no greater way than we are under Sharia law. Neither one has been given to us. So that's where the comparison would be, and, you know, it, I will be accused of blaspheming the law of God for saying that, but, well, I've been called worse things by better people, so, yeah, I guess I'll just have to be fine with that. Well, that's the thing I think has been the saddest in the, in the circumstances around the debate, is that the debate started with acknowledgement that both sides are brothers in Christ, we both consider each other for the most part, to be orthodox. We've got differences on this one issue. And I really hate to see the mudslinging that has come out of it if we really are brothers in Christ and respect each other. Yeah, I think it was his second, I think it was was the second post in American Vision about this, so I heard, uh, like, he, he said the Montana Southern Baptist Convention should uh, kick me out or something like that. I should step down from the pulpit. Well, and I'm not necessarily I, even talking that, just about I, Joel, I, I, but... You know, it doesn't. It doesn't take them long. And so, honestly, when people start thinking Sharia, uh, it's it's not a biblical comparison that they're going after. It is the rabid, angry, insistent, unforgiving, unrelentless, hateful demand that we follow it or we be under judgment. It honestly, it comes across as a little extremist, uh, and of course, it is. 
So I think they bring some of that on them, themselves. You can tell there's no love lost between me and the theonomist. I, I do believe that uh, uh, many of them are brothers in Christ, and we want to honor that. But at the same time, we have to contend for the truth as it has been delivered to the saints. And the saints were not delivered the civil code given to the Commonwealth of Israel. Right. Yeah, and I know you keep talking about the blog posts and the hate mail, you know, and I hope that doesn't come of it. I, you know, I, I brought up some questions generally because I'm wondering, I, I'm curious. I, I don't want to pick fights with theonomists. I don't want to make war with theonomists. I want to understand them. And, and I bring up Sharia because, like you said, I mean, it, that's what people are wondering. And I don't think that theonomy is Sharia, but people are wondering that, and it's worth discussing. And I think theonomists have a reflex on that because it, it is kind of a hard word, but you got to understand that's what, that's what people think. And I know, you know, we're all Christians. We, we all believe things well, that some of the outside yeah, world are going to. Let, let me give two, let me give two points when discussing this with theonomists. Not that I'm an expert for avoiding controversy, but just for the sake of the brethren. First mm-hmm. of all, it's probably healthy to avoid the Sharia comparison because it's so emotional and they're going to flip yeah. out every time. It's probably not helpful. Okay, that's that's the the first thing that I'd say. The, the second one is w- when we discuss the autonomy with the autonomous, uh, again, redefine terms or rather define terms as as quickly as you can, but do yeah. not let them give you the definition of the autonomy that is the etymology of the word, meaning God's law. Because I've seen Cy do this. Cy Tim Brudenkate, who's a friend of mine, I love him dearly. He gave me like five hugs at the debate. <laughs> but you know, I caught him on Facebook saying, "Well, all Christian, all Christians are theonomists. They just don't know it yet." And you know, theonomy just means God's law. Who can be against that? No, no. That's that is either a dishonest, b unlearned, or c disingenuous. Yeah. It's it's one of those are combinations. Sai is the kind of well, guy that I, when when I uh, am saying that I, I want to be Christian brothers in, in love, he, he's definitely the guy I'm thinking of. You know, I've interviewed Sai. I, I, I really like yeah, Sai. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, and, uh, you know, I got friends that are like, well, I guess I'm done with Sai now. That's the autonomy nonsense. No. no, man. Give Sai a year. Give Sai a year because it, the autonomy is one big revolving door. And something, if I could just put some people's minds at ease, people are freaking out saying, everybody I know is becoming a the autonomy. <laughs> big growing movement. Listen, yeah. you will meet far more former theonomists than you will ever meet practicing one. Because theonomy is compelling enough to get people to call themselves theonomists before they even know what it is, because they think, hold on a second, I, I think God's law is good. That's all they know. They call themselves a theonomist. They go in and take a look, and they're like, i got to get out of here. You know, That's a very, like very... A sign di- on the church. You know, it's, it's like seeing the sign on the church door that says, everyone welcome, and and they've got a lighthouse out front, and you know, it's pretty aesthetically pleasing place. You go in, and you're like, "This is nice. This is a good place. Everybody's friendly." <laughs> then the music starts, and they start barking like dogs, falling over backwards, and laughing in the spirit. You're like, "I don't. I got to be getting the heck up out of here." Uh-huh. And you leave because it's nice enough to bring you in, but then you see the crazy on the inside, and you're like, "Uh, I got to go." So maybe Cy will be at the Anonymous forever, but I'd give him a year or two. Yeah. No, I, I interviewed him a while back on this presuppositionalism, and I, I don't regret that one bit. I love Psy. I love uh, you know How to Answer the Fool, I think, was a very powerful presentation on, on uh, apologetics. And uh, you know, he hasn't, this, this hasn't changed my mind on that at all. Yeah, I'm a presuppositionalist, although I won't anathematize you know, evidentialist apologists, but I think uh-huh. there's a place for it. R.C. Sproul kind of gave a dig at presuppositionalism at Shepard. Yeah, I saw that. Uh, but, uh, I'm, I'm a presuppositionalist, um, mm-hmm. probably not quite as hardcore as side is, but I believe it, it glorifies God and all of that. Yeah. And I think well, and, and James White, there are a lot of people, he just said a lot of stuff. Yeah, too. sure. Oh. Although to the honest, you'll find out that there's never anyone that's presuppositional enough. The uh, <laughs> German went on a cruise with uh, Dr. White a while back and theology thing and where he debated, I forget who, and he was complaining that he wasn't presuppositional enough. Um, here's the thing. They're presuppositionalists, they're Vantillian, but again, Vantill vehemently disagreed with uh, Rush Duny and North. Um, and he didn't say anything about Bonson, but Bonson was a student, so I wouldn't expect him to, you know, kind of a colleague and friend, mentor type deal. My caution to people is don't think that they own presuppositionalism. 
um, because they, they preach Van Til. Van Til was an theonomist. In the same way, I met a young lady who was a, just a gorgeous, she seemed very bright, very polite, very godly young lady, you know, just a, just the sweetest little girl. And she basically said, as I understood her, she was there because she was Calvin. And so she just assumed, as I took it, that, you know, Calvinists are theonomists. So that's why she went, that's why she went to the, uh, the debate all the way from California. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no. And as a matter of fact, I talked to a deacon in my church today who uh, has been reading American Vision longer than I knew it existed. And uh, he said, you know, I thought the same thing because I was really big into American Vision um, because I thought, hey, these guys are reformed. This must be a, you know, are we missing out on something? They don't own the narrative. They don't own Calvinism. They don't own presuppositionalism. And most presuppositionalists and most Calvinists are not the honor. Mm-hmm. It really is a relatively small movement. Well, there was w- one thing that you, you brought up many times in the debate, and I think it kind of got lost each time, but it's it was very, very important, and that is this distinction between whether the law is good versus the law being obligatory. And we can all agree that, that the law is just and the law was good. But this, the sticking point seemed to be that Therefore, it must be obligatory. Right. I think if you took all of the laws of the world today and put them in a fishbowl and you just picked a few at random, you'd probably wind up with a better system of laws than what exists in the United States of America. Mm-hmm. I mean, our laws are really bad. Uh, are there uh, elements of, of the civil code given to the Commonwealth of Israel that are better? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Would our country be better off? If we uh, just implemented the civil code and nothing else, well, if you didn't twist and contort the civil code to make it what you want, which is what the anonymous typically do, it would fall into utter catastrophe because it, it, those laws simply weren't designed for our nation, our place and setting, our sitz and laban, our, our life setting, in other words, uh, mm-hmm. from uh, Herman Ginkle. But the principles found therein are, are fantastic. Now, the question is, is it obligatory? For example, I don't know why. I like prison documentaries. Kind of. I guess when you're on Netflix, there's sometimes you run out of things to watch. So <laughs> we'll sit there and we'll watch uh, MSNBC, the you know Lock Up, and, and those different shows. It has become apparent to me <laughs> that our prison system is, is just corrupt. Yeah. And uh, it's it's, it's uh, the prison industrial complex that it's profit motivated. Uh, we have a system of laws in place where you can kill someone and get seven years. You can be convicted of a certain uh, drug crime and, and go to jail for 40. That's messed up, man. That's all there is to it. We had the same amount of people percentage-wise in prison from the founding of our nation until 1970, percentage-wise. In 1970, the prison system really went through a, a change and overhaul. Today, it's 400 times higher than what it's wow. ever been. We're the most, uh, we have more prisoners in America than any other nation in Come the on. world. Combined. I think it's two and a half million, something like that. It's ridiculous. Right. So, it, you know, the theonomists would say, well, there are no prisons in the Bible. This is the restitution. Yeah, I, I, I think we can look at that and try to apply that principle. That's, that's good. Mm-hmm. Is it obligatory? Is what you're saying prisons are sinful and wrong? I think you've, I think you've gone too far. Are we, uh, are we in, are we an heir before God for, Sentencing people to a uh, timeout behind bars. Yeah, I don't, I don't think so. So that's yeah. really the crux of the of the matter. And then again, with the twisting and contorting, it's you know I've heard my opponent and other theonomists harp on the gold standard and the Federal Reserve and well, we're to use you know balance weights and measures, balance uh, weight and measures. Therefore, uh, we need the gold standard. Why the gold standard? Uh, why not silver? Right? Mm-hmm. Why not platinum? Why gold? And, and by the way, I do want the gold standard. I'm a, <laughs> As do I'm, I. I. I want to audit. I want to audit the Fed. All right. As like, do I. I'm as conservative as, I, I'm, I'm as conservative as, as most young. Yep. But I, as a matter of fact, I said this on I think it was the Wingnut Show, and uh, Joe actually emailed to ask me what I meant. I think that I by their in, in their same hermeneutic, I could suggest and argue that socialism accept, is acceptable from the Old Testament uh, civil code. You know, well, how is that? Well, we have the year of Jubilee, right? I'm, I mean, I suppose you could make the case that it's ceremonial, but sure. what's the year of Jubilee? Well, 
it, it is a complete and total absolute redistribution of wealth. That the society has a reset button, and every 50 years, it is reset. And yep. all the wealth and property, you know, wealth is tied up in property. Property is wealth. Yep. Property has always been the number one currency in the world. Number one, that degree of wealth, property is wealth. The property was given back to where it started. It was, it'd be basically the same as if every 50 years everybody turned in their money and it was given back to uh, the original owners uh, down the family line. And, uh, you know, Joel said, well, that's the same thing Jim Wallace says. Well, that's my point. It, it's your hermeneutic. Mm-hmm. So defend whatever political position you want without trying to twist the scriptures to do it. Yeah. I have one last uh, theonomy related question for you before we close. Uh, it's more of a lighthearted one. It came in via Twitter. I tweeted out uh, just about 10 minutes before I called you and said we were going to be talking theonomy if anybody had any questions. Uh, and I had one come in, not a lot of people on Twitter at nine or 10 o'clock at night, but, uh, Matt asked what your most memorable quote was that you came upon during your study of theonomy. Uh, you know, yeah, it's probably, probably anticlimactic for you. <laughs> That's why I said we're kind of wrapping up and lighthearted. It, and it was, it was, it was from, it was from Bonson on uh, Matthew five seventeen through 19. And I remember telling that to James White at lunch the day before the debate and looking at the, the look of pain on his face, like, Oh, uh, that, you know, that hurts. That'd probably be it. I mean, there, listen, Rush, and it, there's probably a lot of close seconds because, listen, Rush Duty was nuts. You know, when they try to provide context from Rush Duty, goodness, I could keep Joel busy on uh, uh, Fury of Blogs for forever trying to provide context for all these quotes. But Rush Duty is like the crazy old racist grandpa that you don't want to come, you know, you don't want to bring him out of the bedroom in his wheelchair at birthday parties. <laughs> He's just going to say something racist and slap, slap his niece on the butt or something. He He's insane. The things that Rush Duty promoted, including as long as, you know, we were talking about it, the ceremonial aspects of the Levitical Holiness Code uh, in regards to kosher law. Yeah. Rush Duty was was uh, flat out Galatian Judaizer. Rush Duty, as I said, didn't believe in the polygraph. Uh, Rush Duty uh, didn't believe in agricultural science. Uh, Rush Duty uh, didn't believe in interracial marriage. This is their this is their founder, and so typically the conversation says, "Well, you don't understand the autonomy. You need to read Rush Duty, and then you read Rush Duty, and it's like, well, Rush Duty is not the be all end all of the autonomy, right? Yeah, because you I I saw what was there, mm-hmm. and see that's the danger. One of the things that was brought up in the debate. I brought up uh, is that what is required for theonomy to work is a whole new class of scribes and Pharisees to create a, a, a New Testament Mishnah and Reconstructionist Talmud uh, to interpret the civil code and apply it to our day and time. And Rushdie provided part of that in Institutes of Biblical Law, the three editions of that book, which if you go to first, it's like $120, it's nuts. But it, it is the, the Talmud for, uh, it's a start. It's just one tiny, tiny little start. And look how he interprets the civil code. Believe me, that is put through a lens of, of humanism and, and carnality. And I'm not calling him, you know, aggressively sinful, but it is put through the distorted lens of a fallen man. And what comes out is frightening, racist, scary stuff. You know, Joel talked about the boogeyman quotes, but he didn't refute any of the debate. There are tons of boogeyman quotes. And so Bonson seems to be the rational guy that, you know, if I was a theonomist, I, I wouldn't want to bring up Bonson. And I, frankly, I wouldn't want to bring up North either. But um, yeah, if, if, if you want to see some crazy theonomy quotes, just like turn to any page at random and just the biblical law and see Rushdie's take on stuff. It's, it's hmm. bizarre. Okay. Well, Jordan, I thank you so much. I mean, we've gone a little long on this one. We're certainly over an hour. I thank you for taking the time to come on with me and, and actually for approaching me. I think it was it was uh, serendipitous that it came in as I'm editing the Federal Vision one with the crossover there and stuff. But as we close, uh, I, wanna, I want you to talk about more about your ministry. You've, you talked about it a little last time you were on, but what do you have going on? All right. <laughs> yeah, Matt. Matt's going to hurt me if I don't mention Reformation Montana, so... <laughs> That's June 25th through 27th, Billings, Montana. It's just a couple hours down the interstate, 
from uh, from Yellowstone National Park. Mm-hmm. Uh, this year we're going to have Todd Friel. Phil Johnson is back. He's always been with us. He's kind of our always great. mascot, loving mascot. Yep. We're going to have uh, Chris Roseboro again, our resident Lutheran. You are friends. Um, and we we talked about Chris, but you guys are bot- our, our pals, and that wasn't just rhetorical. Yeah, you know, Chris is a uh, Chris used to tutor me in Greek, actually. Um, <laughs> he, he, he oh yeah, preach. Yeah, you he know what? Preach a sermon. Yeah. I, well, I I I I met uh, since the last time we interviewed. I met a mutual friend of ours that uh, is in a little church up in uh, up in Canada, just across the border in uh, in Saskatchewan. Har- Harley Harley Porter or Kevin Lackey? Kevin Lackey. Yeah, Kevin. Kevin yeah. knows everyone on the planet. <laughs> Kevin's yeah, a great I guy. I call Kevin. I call Kevin my Canadian in laws because. Uh, <laughs> Uh, he, his his daughter married one of my best friends down here in Sydney from my church, and so we kind of uh, I think I, I think of it as linking kingdoms almost. Like our, yeah, our Kevin's, are joined, Kevin's a great guy. A union now. Well, he goes yeah, on vacation in the in yeah. September, and they go they've got an RV, and they drive they drive through town, and uh, they always stop by and go to church with us for at yeah. least once. And he was at the he was at the debate in Phoenix actually. Oh, okay. And uh, yeah, he was down there camping out by the border, <laughs> and uh, decided to just. Stop yeah. Then. So well, we went through I a church Kevin split a couple of years ago, and uh, a new church was born, and uh, we call it Gospel of Grace Fellowship. And then he went through a church split as well, and he liked the name, and so now they have Gospel of Grace Fellowship as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, but for the sake of his reputation, I wouldn't say. Did you say church discipline? Church, church split. split. We had a church split. Oh, and... split. I was, it wasn't discipline. Yeah, no. That's a. It's an awesome church, and it's mm-hmm. one of those situations where some folks don't like truth so we're happy that uh that, that we, but he did we mention that you and chris were tutoring him in greek yeah well it wasn't me it was all chris well. he, he heard my sermon the modern day downgrade and chris came up to me with tears in his eyes and uh he just asked me do you know greek i'm like what uh well i had greek in college not <laughs> a scholar and uh he's like well listen you need if you're you need to know greek better not that I used any Greek. He, he wasn't pointing out a, a flaw in my preacher or anything, but he just took it upon himself to teach me Greek. So he's an, he's an awesome guy. And then also cool. we have... Uh, yeah, I was going to say, get back self. to who's going to be uh, Reformation Montana. We didn't need a whole yeah, sidetrack. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, Mike Avendroff. Of, uh, love Mike. Mike. Radio. I love Mike. He's... Uh, myself and a fellow by the name of The Squirrel. Uh, Too who, quiet, uh, yeah. Kind of, kind of famous in social media. Yep. For what I'm not sure, but uh, he is the squirrel, uh-huh. and everyone knows him. So uh, he he serves on the Refmont board with me. And the theme of the conference is the church. It's going to be at the Holiday Inn and Convention Center, and it's, it's always an awesome time. That the, it's only a thirty five dollar registration fee. You only have to pay for three members of your family. If you, if you have like if you're a quiverful family and you got ninety seven <laughs> kids, you only have to pay for three of them. Um, and if you can't afford the registration, email me at pulpitandpin at gmail.com. We'll make sure that you get in. We always have the Lindy Tune uh-huh. uh, folks that call angry that we're prostituting the Word of God for selling a conference. Listen, if, if that's your conviction, you don't want to pay for it, all you got to do is call and let us know. Um, sure. it, it, it's always an awesome time because, you know, there's only a few hundred people that come, three, four hundred, five hundred, whatever, in years past. So you get time to like sit down and have a cup of coffee with Phil Johnson or Todd Friel yeah, or, awesome. you know, Bodie was there last year. People just got to sit down with him and watch the conference with him. And it's, you know, Phil says it's his favorite conference, uh, that he's not contractually obligated to be at. <laughs> uh, grace to you. So it's, cool. it's, it's an awesome time. You can find out about it at reformationmontana.org to register online. And, uh, I believe we're going to be giving away uh, free books again this year. Cool. So, like, you definitely get thirty-five dollars worth of worth of stuff when you come. Yep. And uh, excellent time. Then we had Voice in the Wilderness. Radio I wanted you too. to talk about uh, that too. Talk about Voice in the Wilderness. That's an awesome ministry you got going on. Do we carry your show? You do, yeah. And that's not why I okay, want you to bring right. it up, but I. <laughs> yeah. Well, we have a really great station manager, Will Sanders, that uh, handles yep. everything for us. And uh, I think a fellow by the name of Tom Sullivan is going to start helping with that, too. Basically, uh, it's 24-7 uh, streaming radio. We have apps for Droid and iPhone, so you can listen on your phone. Yep. Um, or you can go listen on the website. And uh, most of it is uh, just Reformed Baptist preaching from Voices in the Wilderness. That means 
it's from guys that you don't necessarily uh, know of. We yeah. play a guy by the name of Charlie Fred Rico, who pastors a, a very small church in uh, in Montana, and uh, he's a master's graduate, but fantastic expositor. It's guys that are just wonderful men of God that you, you would never hear of if it yeah. wasn't for BWR. Uh, you know, guys like Earl Blackburn, and then uh, who has come to be known rightfully so as the Spurgeon of, of Arkansas. Oh, what's his name? I forget the Spurgeon of Arkansas. And then in the evening, we have Paul Washer, we have Phil Johnson, MacArthur, uh, Albert Martin, Paul Washer. They've all given us permission to play their stuff. Uh, and then we, we have a few podcasts. We, we have Yano's Cross Encounters. We have uh, Kevin Swanson's Generations Radio. We have uh, yours probably yep. on the weekend, I'm guessing. Yeah, weekend. Uh... I think we play the Bible Company Wing Night now. If not, I need to go send them an invitation. I think I asked yeah. somebody to do that. And if my show ever comes back, open in. So, yeah. It's, I, yeah, it's I great. love it. Now, what, what, it had crossed my what mind. We're hoping to do. Oh, I was going to say, it crossed my mind I, that I, I would love to start something like that, having wonderful preaching by guys you've never heard of. And, um, you know, it was kind of more of a pipe dream for me because it's hard to find those guys, you know. If they've never heard of them, how are you going to find them, you know? And you guys yeah, it did it, and it's and awesome. If you, listen, if you're a pastor listening and you're like, man, I because I know what it's like. I know what it's like. To, every Sunday morning, I got 130 people in my church. Mm-hmm on any given Sunday, you walk in and you get depressed because you're like, man, I, I'm preaching to a few people. I mean, there might be guys out there preaching to five people. Yeah. And uh, you, you know what? If you want your sermons to reach um, a whole lot more folks, um, send us your information. I don't know where because I don't, I don't, uh, I'm not hands-on, but you can find it on the website. It's wildernessradio.com. And as soon as somebody gets out of rotation, we'll put you in rotation, assuming you're not a heretic and you're not a terrible preacher. Mm-hmm. It's no offense to the terrible preachers, but you know what I mean. <laughs> um, we want to put we want to put quality on the website. Now, our goal is uh, what I what I desire is to work with shortwave radio stations that can broadcast this into the third world. Oh, that would be into awesome. island nations because. There are places in this world, believe it or not, they don't even have AM. They're so far out in the middle of nowhere. Most of the third world, the only access to radio they have is shortwave. And we would like to find a shortwave radio station. I've talked to several, but right now it's just not feasible financially. Mm -hmm. If somebody wanted to help out with that, it it might be a chunk of change. But we want to get them to broadcast our BWR feed on their power uh, so as to uh, get the the best, most solid Reformed Baptist preaching that's awesome. uh, in, into the world. And uh, that's our goal. That's what we cool. want to do with that. Well, it's a great ministry. So, and I and I don't say that because you guys are playing Echo Zoe on the weekends. I, it really is a, a, an awesome ministry, and I'm glad to, you guys got it started. Yeah, and if you, you know, if, if you want to help out, just, man, post it on your Facebook page, send it mm-hmm. out on Twitter, download the app, and... and uh, I, it's one of the. I guess the reason I, I thought about doing that, Andy, is because whenever somebody's being discipled in my church, I always recommend buying a MP3 player, mm-hmm. and then they're not technologically savvy. So then it's okay, Pastor. Can you load this up with stuff, and I'll download wretched, and, sure. you know, sermons from various guys and stuff like that. Grace to you and. You know, then I'm downloading, like, I'm, I've got, like, on my desk a stack of half a dozen iPods I'm trying to load up. <laughs> it's so much easier now. It's so much easier now to say, hey, you want to be a disciple through good preaching? Just tune in to VWR. Just download the app, and, and you don't have to worry about, mm-hmm. you know, downloading, on, um, you know, a bunch of uh, sermons and having to redo that. Well, there's, so, it's a lot like RefNet, and I love RefNet, but... The thing I love about VWR is that RefNet is big name people. You know, it's Alistair Begg, it's R.C. Sproul, it's John MacArthur. And these guys have an audience. I mean, they're, they're, they're not struggling to, to, hear, to get ears. And VWR is great for the guys who are working just as hard, they're just as faithful, and they're just as orthodox, and they're just as good. They just don't have the ears. And, and that's... Well, it's, yeah, it's like when Paul Watcher was asked who's the greatest preacher of our day? And you know what Paul Washer's answer was, Andy? The guy you've never heard of? The guy you've never heard of. 
Yeah. He's out there in a the jungle somewhere preaching to two or three tribesmen. You've never heard him, but he's the best that there is. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the that's the truth, brother. And how many? Listen, here's the thing: how many John MacArthur's are there? Just uh, people say there's only one John MacArthur. No, there's not. Mm-hmm. I love John MacArthur. There's more than one. There's thousands of them. Men that aren't offered a, a deal by a publisher to, uh, to to write a commentary for the entire New, New Testament. They're not a best-selling author. They don't have thousands of people in their church, but they're just as bright. They work just as hard. Their sermons are just as good, um, and they honor God just as much. Uh, mm-hmm. But you've never heard of them. And the goal of EWR is so that you can. Yeah, amen. So you got Refor- Reformation Montana, Voice of the Wilderness Radio. Anything else you want to mention? No, that's that's about it. I don't I don't really write at uh, pulpit and pen anymore. Um, okay. But the, the contributors do, and they're always uh, man. It's it's amazing. Uh, I look at the Alexa ratings uh, once in a while. If that's what it's called, um, the website ratings online, and I can't believe how many people read the pulpit and pen and. And how high we up are in the uh, in the ratings, just cool. thousands of people a day looking at it. And uh, you know, we we broke the story about uh, Alex Malarkey's fake trip to oh, yeah. He sent to us. He sent to us his letter to Lifeway. Uh-huh. And um, next thing we know, like the pulpit and pen is on the Today Show. I woke up and somebody sent me a link. Matt Lauer posted the pulpit and pen logo. Oh, awesome. On the Today Show, and it's in the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, the New York Daily News, the London Telegraph, all over the world. Yeah. So, Pulp and Pen's a pretty neat thing. Yeah. Um, for a bunch of uh, for a bunch of angry people that nobody listens. To. <laughs> so. Yeah, and that happened about the same time. O-R-G. Yeah, I had uh, Justin Peters on in December, and we talked about uh, mostly Burpo and uh, a few of the others. But Malarkey came up, and he mentioned that, that uh, Alex had uh, come out and said that it wasn't true, and that happened just. Right about that time, that was that was kind of interesting timing too. Yeah, Justin's a great guy. So yeah, well, Jordan, thanks so much. I appreciate your time and I appreciate your input on theonomy and uh, discussion. And uh, went a little bit long there, just uh, having some friendly chit chat. But uh, it's always fun, and I, I love having you on. And you've been a great minis- uh, friend of the ministry too. And and I thank you for that. Sure thing. It's good talking to you, Andy. Yeah. Echo Zoe Radio is an outreach of Echo Zoe Ministries. If you are blessed by the show, please consider offering your support. There are many things you can do to help, including prayer, sharing the show with others, and your financial support. Echo Zoe Ministries is a registered nonprofit organization with 501c3 tax exempt status, and your donations are tax deductible. For more information about how you can support Echo Zoe Ministries, please visit echozoe.com support. Well, that wraps up episode 83. Thanks for listening to Echo Zoe Radio. For show notes, including uh, outline of the discussion, list of scriptures referenced, and additional resources, I do take some time to go find other articles and areas of interest to help you learn a little bit more about the subject, in this case, a theonomy. You can go to echozoe.com slash 83. Don't forget to follow Echo Zoe on Twitter. It's at Echo Zoe. Or like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Echozoe Ministries. You can also add Echozoe to your Google Plus circles by going to plus Echo Zoe. Lord willing, I'll be back next month for the April 2015 episode of Echo Zoe Radio. <laughs>